Howdy folks, welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory, and today is Monday, April the 4th, 2016, and I have the great honor of welcoming to the show, for the first time, Mike from Silver Farm, and Mike's website is an audio MP3 website, and he hosts a world of the people that we all listen to and follow, like um, TF Metals Report, Daily Coin, Shadow of Truth. Give us a couple of others, Mike, that you that you have over there. Uh, we've got exclusively Andy Hoffman from Miles Franklin, um, Jason Burak from Wall Street from Main Street, has been one of our uh, longest running contributors. Um, we relay um, S, um, the Silver Doctors audio weekly that they do and then any of the supplemental stuff. Um, James Corbett, um, and a number of others that come across, um, that come across interesting topics. Well, I know you've got just a a world going on over there and it's growing like crazy. And Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Rory. Uh, it's snowing in April, but otherwise I'm doing all right. How are you today? I'm all right. I I love global warming. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I could use a little bit more of it up here today. (laughs) Oh, well, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we'll just jump right in. What do you say? Sounds great. Yeah, I I thought that was, I thought uh, the Free State Project was Maine, but it's New Hampshire. Yep, it's it's New Hampshire. And um, they're, I mean, they're they're great. I mean, I'm a native from up here. I actually was born across the river in Vermont, but, you know, their only, the only issue is, is that they're, they're coming. They're coming about pretty heavy-handed, and you know the 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 regular folks around here have not embraced the ideas as much. I think as they had had, uh, if they'd had some ambassadors, right, and had come a little bit more softly, I think that they would have, you know, had had a little more buy-in from the populace. But the bottom line is, the populace is not involved, and these guys are, and they are um, very active, and they've made some huge gains within state government, and. Um, so far, it doesn't look like the power is going to their head. So far, they're pushing in the right direction. So. Well, that's good. Hopefully, that trend will continue. I mean, yeah, I'm no sure doubt. you're familiar with the um, uh, state of Jefferson, and there's a couple of other fairly large pushes to secede. There's, yeah, again, there's one in Colorado also. There's another, there's another group. I can't remember what, the, what, their, what their organization is. Yeah, I know, and and I really hope that that idea makes it makes it back into the popular you know popular lexicon that you know that dividing ourselves up to take care of problems is kind of is the way it was what was intended, and it's not a bad it's not a bad thing at all, you know, to to bring the power back to a local level. Well, that's the way that it was designed. That is no, exactly. I mean, that's what the Constitution is all about. That's why it's called the United States. Right, not the United States. Yes, exactly. Yes, that one S is a. Oh yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things. That's why it's been so important to not teach, you know, original intent to the to the population at large because they would get the wrong ideas, you know. Yeah, like you have freedom. <laughs> right. Right. You don't like. like uh, we're yeah. we're not here to, as a self serving, uh, self perpetuating uh, body. Or as uh, Gerald Salente calls, "Gang of 535, we're actually yeah. here to do very little. Yes, yeah, and uh, and the idea that you should be able to, you know, with within a short drive, get to the the offices of your officials and wring their neck if need be, you know, is something that uh, is completely escapes people. But um, you know, we see the consequences of it. We do, we are we're living through the consequences of being lazy and arrogant, which is one of the things that I believe that we've been taught. I mean, I I believe that it goes back to the indoctrination system. We'll call it public education and what they have done in particular with history and civics and social studies and math, all of these things that provide children with the critical thought have been completely stripped out, not to mention 
uh, art and music. Art and right. music. I mean, art and music were, were stripped out of uh, public education soon after I left. And I graduated high school in 1980. And soon after that, art and music were came under attack and they were completely stripped out of the system. They were waning when I was leaving. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll only, I only have one small quarrel, and that's in, in terms, which is that we don't have a public education system. No, we have a public school system, and in nature, you know, the word school is only really used one other way, and that's as in a school of fish, where there is a gigantic collective that moves together, you know, based on these unseen forces, whoever the lead fish is that you can't even identify from the outside, you know, makes one little move and the whole, the whole school responds. And, you know, this is by, this is by design. I mean, the, yes. the, you, um, you don't have to be a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, you know, which, which I'm, which I'm not to go back and look at, what was being discussed, you know, when the public school system was first devised, um, you know, the, these people had no problem spelling out, you know, in v extremely precise terms, what they were hoping to accomplish. Um, you know, at this time, which you, if you transport yourself back to around the time of the civil war, a little bit before over in Prussia, which is, you know, modern in the area of modern day Germany, um, they found that their soldiers were not being good soldiers. They were not working as a school, working as a unit, as a team. And the intellectuals at that time posited that this was because they po they had too much uh, critical thinking ability. That they were they were far too free thinking because these armies were, you know, they were amassed from the common folk. And to harken back to that time there and also here, the vast majority of people had their own independent livelihoods. They did not work for, you know, a company. And if you did work for a company, it was only to build some capital and build some skills to strike out on your own. And so these intellectuals went about, went about a slow, methodical um, process of devising this schooling system. And they were, they had in mind that they needed workers. They needed workers um, because of, this is the dawn of the Industrial Revolution where you're asking people to perform repetitive, monotonous tasks. They needed to be smart enough to perform these tasks, but not, not smart enough to strike out on their own. And this is the dawn of the progressive era where it was all about planning it was all about you know constructing this new modern human that you had a ruling class and then you had the much larger class of workers and so the roots of the public schooling system you know are found right there and you know now you know 150 years later you see you know the effects of it which is is easy it is to get upset with the people that we see that have their heads buried so firmly in the sand um i you know i have a lot of empathy for these people because they know no different they were set up to fail from the from the uh very beginning um you know if you wanted to make independent critical thinking humans you would not devise a system such as the current public school system right <laughs> And they're planning on making it even worse by rolling out uh, Common Core, which is the reason that we're speaking today. And I know that you have, from conversation in the past, that, that you have homeschooled your children in order to avoid the rigors of Common Core and what it's what its potential is to take this whole indoctrination system to a whole nother level of dumbed down. I, I personally believe that it's going to, that it has the potential to strip all intelligence out of the children and to I, make them nothing more 
than another widget in the in the machine and that's it that's that's mm -hmm. the sole purpose of it and when and i live in tennessee and i live in nashville which is the capital and when they introduced common core to the state of tennessee it's been about 18 months 18 months to 20 to two years ago they had all of these business leaders you know, praising it, saying how great it is and how wonderful and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, this common core. And now they are threatening. They've not, they're not threatening. They are tying um, certain federal budget items to the rolling out of common core. If you don't, you incorporate common core into your curriculum your federal road funds will be cut off which but, as we all know that is a massive massive chunk of our money that gets returned to us oh absolutely this is i mean this is straight out of their playbook i mean they've done this so many times from the the drinking age to the the 55 mile an hour national speed limit um, you know, one of the one of the most hamstringing factors for local and state governments has been the interstate highway system, um, where you know that is the universal club. You know, they the the federal government collects the money out of the states, and then they have to comply, you know, to get it back. Um, we actually started um, educating um, our own kids, you know, completely reluctantly. Um, our, my son was in public school until, um, until April of first grade. And we, we really, we had no choice. Um, you know, he was absolutely miserable. Um, he was convinced that he hated to read. He was never going to read. It was just terrible. And for an entire, the entire school year, we complied with exactly what the school asked us to do. Um, I was leaning much more towards educating our own kids uh, than my wife. And I knew the only way that um, I was going to get her on board with this because <laughs> her mother and her father were public school teachers. My mother was actually a public school teacher. And to give her the courage of her conviction to push back, you know, against this, you know, family pressure, um, you know, it had to be obvious to her that there was no other way. And so for the entire year, and unfortunately, um, you know, to the detriment of our child, we did everything we, they wanted us to do. We gave them well more than enough rope to hang themselves with. And they did an admirable job. I mean, they, they were, <laughs> they were terrible. I mean, I mean, they were literally terrible. You know, when, when what they were doing wasn't working, their only solution was we're going to do it more and we're going to do it harder. And we're going to put in place penalties, you know, and, and take this away and take that away. And, and you know, the final straw was it was April break. And on f the Friday before the week off, we were at the bookstore looking for books to take with us on vacation. And we asked, you know, JK, you know, you want to pick out a book to, you know, you, maybe you can read to us. And he clenched his fists and he got angry, turned bright red. He said, I'm never going to read. I hate reading. I don't want any. And, and that's when my wife and I are just like, all right. That's enough, and he didn't. He didn't go back after vacation, and wow. and he hasn't. He hasn't been back since. And you know, we gave him about six months off completely to just be a kid and de school and de stress. And now, you know, he's he's reading well beyond what his what he's supposed to be for grade level. Um, you know, that's a whole nother issue where you have these. You know, the schools are divided up into these arbitrary units by age when that's not how kids are. I mean, kids are individuals. Right. And, um, and the other thing I think that doesn't get much attention at all is that the public schools have become extremely toxic for boys. Um, you know, boys and girls are different. Um, you know, I hate to break that to people, but other, even other than their mechanical hardware, boys and girls are different and they learn different ways and they have, you know, different needs and they have systematically cut out, you know, activities, they've cut out recess, um, you know, even gym class was so micromanaged 
that, you know, the boys were getting in trouble for being too energetic, you know, in gym class. It was just ridiculous. Um, too energetic in gym class. Too energetic in gym class. You know, and then the solution is, well, we'll just drug them into compliance. And, you know, an outcome, you know, the, the, you know, the favorites of, you know, Ritalin or Adderall or any of the other stimulant medications to literally, you know, drug the, drug the boys mostly, the vast majority, drug the boys into, you know, submission. submission. Yeah. They, they have no other choice. Now, how long ago did you take your son out of uh, school? We'll be going on two years here in just a couple of weeks. Okay, and what was the, how did you go about doing that? Did you just go into the school and say, we're done with you guys, see you later, our child is out of here? Or what was the, what did you have to do? Well, the state of New Hampshire makes it, it makes it incredibly easy to educate your own kids, which is basically, you. it's the way that, it, it's really the way that it should be. Um, you know, maybe we'll get to this later, but. I think that this poses one of the more serious threats because it seems to be gaining traction. But in any event, so um, after finding out what we needed to do, um, the I honestly completed the entire process with one email where I just wrote out my name, kid's name, our, that we were intending it, and I emailed it to the uh, to the superintendent. I mean, I, I honestly wouldn't. I didn't. I wouldn't even give them you know, the, um, the respect of walking into their office and pretending like I was going to ask them permission. I mean, I notified them and that, and that was it. Um, you know, and if you can't tell, I'm, I was, and still am a little bit indignant, um, because, you know, in the end, nobody asked. No, I mean, this is a, this is still within our society. This is a huge thing. And, you know, for people that do it, you know, one of the hardest things to overcome, excuse me, is the, um, societal pressure you know, to go to public school. And so to take this monumental step, nobody asked why. Not a single person in the superintendent's office, not their teachers, not the principal, nobody asked us why we would be doing such a thing. Um, they basically, you know, they don't even want to know that we exist. Um, I can't get numbers from them as far as how many kids in the district are opting out of the educational system for whatever reason. Um, they are they are really in you know very very obviously keeping their heads in the sand so that they don't have to deal with this you know mounting problem. Um, you know there a lot of people raise concerns that homeschooled kids or home educated kids are not um, properly socialized. Well, you know if you mean that they're not thrown with a bunch of kids that are the same age and consist of you know, a lot of kids whose families don't bring good values to the table, then yeah, that's not the kind of socialization my kids get. But, you know, there are so many families that have taken their kids out of the public school that, you know, my kids play with other kids all the time. We set up co-op, we set up sort of these impromptu co-ops where a parent that is passionate about something puts on a little class and the kids get involved. And the ones that want to do it, do it. And the ones that don't, don't. I mean. You know, when we have when we have groups to get together, I mean, you have kids from four years old to 12 years old, all mixing it up, you know, and playing in the same space. You know, the older ones, it's good for them. It slows them down. They take a step back. They become a little bit more nurturing towards the younger kids, you know, and the younger kids have role models to look up to. And these are role models that we've been able to select as a family that meet with, you know, our family values. Um you know, we're not about telling people, and I, I would never tell anybody how to raise their kid. We're just about exercising our own choice, you know, and uh, You're aligning right. the. Yeah, our it's right. Not a it's choice; parents. it's a right. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I, Big I agree. Uh, there is, there is. People won't, people won't, people won't grant you that. And I guess I'm a little bit sensitive in speaking to this topic because you can see all around you what the public school system has done, including making people believe that if you don't go to public school, you know, you're going to end up you know, in a van down by the river. Yeah. The, the, you have, you have no, no future. Um, but you know, the, the future for our kids is, is great and they may go to college. They may not. I mean, by the time they get old enough, um, unless it's a really specific technical discipline, I think that the usefulness of college, I mean, it's pretty much gone already. Um, yes. It'll be, 
it'll be even less so. Um, you know, but what we're preparing our kids to be is they're going to be, you know, entrepreneurs. Um, we look and it's hard because my, neither my wife or I were trained in this mindset, but we are quickly trying to bring ourselves up to speed where we look around our community and say, what needs to be done? What do people want to do? You know, that they're willing to pay us for. And, you know, as example, my, you know, my, he's eight now, he was eight, that my eight year old um, grew a patch of pumpkins last year, hauled them down to the farmer's market. And then one day made himself 110 bucks. <laughs> and for an eight year old, that's not bad. That's pretty you know? awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and he was, he was absolutely psyched. I mean, it worked out great. It was the one, bef- it was the farmer's market right before Halloween. And everybody likes buying from cute little kids and they cleaned them out. They absolutely. So he's already and, and talk about out. talk about a way of building self-esteem and, and self-awareness. Yep. And the, not to mention the values and, and everything that goes with the gardening aspect and then running the business aspect. I mean, there's just huge. Oh right. my goodness, man. That's awesome, Mike. I mean, yeah. seriously, yeah. that's really, that's a we great are, story. We're extremely excited for him and, and very excited about that. And, and, you know, and now, like I said, this year he's already ordered what seeds he wants. He saved some of the seeds <laughs> from his best performing pumpkins last year. You know, um, they um, both, my, I, my son is eight, my daughter is seven, and they both, work for about an hour every night on a really small local dairy farm. Um, again, gets them some pay, but they get exposed to the skills and, you know, and he, but for him, what he sees is, well, now I have, now I have the in to get my fertilizer for next year to grow more pumpkins. <laughs> so, so he's been wheeling and dealing with the farmer to, you know, trade labor for manure. And, you know, it's, again, it's, it's a one-off, but that's his niche, you know, and he found it. And, um, I think that there are little things like that that everybody can do. Cause like you say, it just, it sows this spark, you know, it, it just, and you know, it, it's all it takes to get these guys interested, um, is, you know, seeing the, the happy customers and the money roll in. And it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. And it sounds like your son is already latching on to this whole other dynamic that goes with growing and critical thought like we were talking about a minute ago that's being suppressed completely that is enriching his life and enriching your life and your wife's life and and your entire community it enriches everyone everyone wins it is it is the it's the ultimate you know it's the ultimate micro example of the free market everybody's yes. happy Everybody wins. Happy. Everybody you know, wins in a free market. And, and and if your son goes on to become a farmer, according to Jim Rogers, he's going to be a very wealthy young man. Because yeah. as the as as Jim Rogers has pointed out, you know, for some time, and I think it was about a year ago that he he released the information that the average age of the farmer in America was fifty eight years old. Yep. So 10 years from now, when your son is 18, the average age will be probably north of 65 or even closer to 70. A- so you know, absolutely. Talk you know, about I- a, Talk about a, a market waiting to, to be tapped. I mean, there it is. I mean, I'm not saying that your son's going to grow up and be a farmer, but if he loves it, the, you know, 10 years from now, the way that he does now, my goodness. He'll be, he'll be in like Flynn. <laughs> uh, ab, you know, absolutely. And, but you know, the thing is, is that, you know, kind of back to what I was started this with, nobody knows what's that even going to be, what the world's going to look like in even 10 years. And so, you know, this is, you know, it's a great thing, but again, we try not to be very narrow on our focus. Um, if there's something that's interesting, we try to explore it you know, to, to, to where, you know, to, to its end, to its conclusion, till they lose interest or say, all right, you know, I, I know enough about that and we'll, you know, we'll move on. Um, and, and, and speaking of which, I, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, I want to go back because I think it's something that's, that's important to the conversation. And that is, you said that your wife was reluctant and mm-hmm. that there was some, 
that you guys had to go through some uh, stress and strain in order to, to reach the point of where you're at currently. Where is she at in all of this development as far as your, your children being homeschooled and her role and what she, where is she at at this point? Well, um, she's a hundred percent on, she's a hundred percent on, she's a hundred percent on board. Um, you know, now, um, you know, the one, one thing that, and I don't know why, and I'd really like to explore this, but you know, neither my wife or I had all of our critical thinking faculties, you know, beaten out of us sufficiently. Um, you know, we both are able to take a look at what is, and, and apply our own thought process and logic to it and come up with you know, the logical conclusion. And so, you know, it once we were at that point that we had to do something else, the public school just wasn't doing it, um, you know, that was the impetus to, you know, having her, you know, embrace learning about different ideas, you know, and different techniques. And, you know, it, it really is... Um, you know, you just try, you try things and you keep what works and you discard what doesn't. Um, she, she right now, I'm the, the primary breadwinner and, you know, she takes care of most of, you know, most of the education. I mean, I do stuff for them, you know, evenings and weekends. And I also, there's another family we're very close with and they have two boys who are 11 and nine. And so I do, because I'm very hands-on, very mechanical. We do mechanical projects. We make catapults, and we make, you know, all kinds of fun projectile shooting things, because that's what boys like. Um, You know, and so I try to get involved as as much as I can. But, uh, you know, she's completely on board. And the funniest thing is that, you know, she got a lot of harassment, a lot of pushback from from her mom, especially when this started. But, you know, um the way our kids have blossomed and grown, you know, being given their own educational space, it it, it says everything you need to know. We don't need, we don't, there's no refuting what we're doing anymore. Um, Right. You know, my, my wife's sister who has kids of similar ages that are in the public school system. I mean, you know, intellectually, you know, my daughter, my younger daughter, especially she, she just runs circles around them. I mean, she, she's, she's, she uses, appropriate language she's well spoken um she's she's thoughtful you know she's not impulsive she doesn't need to be told what to do every hour of the day she's she's completely able to you know to stand on her own and figure out what it is and you know if you if you cross her if you do something that is not you know goes against and violates her basic rights she's going to tell you and she's going to dress you down you know in a an appropriate way and, and let you know that, you know, her needs, you know, her needs aren't being met, you know, and you're, you know, and you're aggressing against her. And I think it's just, you know, it's just, it's just great. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about being there, you know, every second, you know, to defend my kids against other kids because they do a perfectly good job on their own and they do it with words. They do it with, you know, with ideas and, um, you know, they've learned how to negotiate. <laughs> how to be diplom- how to be diplomatic because we don't we really try very hard not to be authoritarian because you know the idea that raising kids in an authoritarian way where you sit down shut up raise your hand to go to the bathroom you know every little bit of your life is micromanaged it really just conditions people you know to live under rulers it conditions people to live under you know under tyranny and so, you know, we want our, you know, we want our kids to call it out when they see it in a, in an re- appropriate, you know, and respectful way. And so we, we try to respect them. We were just having a conversation yesterday about how, you know, there was some feedback, you know, and feedback and things that, that our son was doing that we didn't really care for. And we're like, well, all right, well, that's probably just mirroring how we're acting. And rather than in other families where, no, you don't act this way because I said so we don't, we really don't have that. We don't have that club. We don't have that club to use. And so, you know, it makes us be better people. It makes us be more patient. It makes us, you know, <clears throat> speak more respectfully, you know, as we all should, um, simply because we don't, we don't allow ourselves that, uh, you know, that easy out of saying, well, you know, do as I say, not as I do. So you're getting educated as well. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's so hard to change, so hard to change ingrained habits, you know, at middle age that I, you know, I, I really, I mean, our kids are going to have a much better, a much better shot. I mean, I can only imagine if I knew what I know now, you know, when I was in my teenage years, you know, um, I would have been hell on wheels, you know, now I mean, haven't had a bad life by any stretch of the imagination. I'm very blessed, but you know, to have that, those, those, um, you know, brain shackles released to have, you know, to have your, your thought freed to go in, in any direction that makes sense, you know, is, uh, you know, it, it's a blessing that you can't even put a, a price on. Last question, Mike. And yeah. that is you had, you'd said that public education is geared more towards stripping the masculinity out of the males. And I would like for you to elaborate on that as far as to help me understand what you mean uh, by that. Sure. And I mean, I, and I don't know if um, anybody who's had children knows that typically, you know, boys and girls, um, interact with their environments, you know, in very different ways. Um, you know, boys like to touch and poke and handle, you know, things and girls tend to be more, they want to touch everything, everything. And girls are, are happier in general, again, in general, um, with, you know, uh, art coloring, sitting down, you know, um, and being more, you know, settled, more sedentary. And, Purely from a management point of view, the public schools have to embrace this model where everybody is sitting down and doing the same thing, working on the same things, because coming up with individual lesson plans just doesn't work. And we're also seeing the knock on effects of the misguided aspects of the movement, in my opinion, where we have. We have tried this. We've tried to hammer in the point that the only difference between boys and girls is their plumbing, and it's it's simply not true. Nor would we want it to be true. I mean, the different aspects that these different you know ways of thinking bring you know bring to us. I mean, it's just we are much richer for it. Um, but you know, um, everything. I mean, boys like boys like guns. With so the funniest thing is we are a uh, you know. Um, a completely nonviolent household. I mean, of anything I deplore the most, it's violence and war. And then I was just absolutely astounded to see, you know, when my boys were younger, the first thing the boys do when they get together is they pick up sticks and start pointing them at each other. You know, and everything's <laughs> a gun and everything's a weapon. And it's, it's, it's hilarious to watch. But now you send those same boys to public school. And if they put their fingers into the wrong pattern like a gun, you know, they're getting – you know, they're getting kicked out or at the very least, you know, they're getting the full weight of, um, the state. Uh, yeah. Or, or just, or just the, um, the social, the social pressure, the pressure of social norms applied to them to change. And it, it's, it's complete. I mean, it's completely misguided and it's completely wrong. I mean, and it really is just the definition of trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit. Um, and then, you know, you had spoken about Common Core and, you know, I mean, besides the fact that it was written by, you know, lobbyists, as we see all these large legislations happen doing, there is no feedback mechanism to change. So if they are making inevitable mistakes, there's no way to change this. And these mistakes are applied to huge swaths of the population. Um, you know, I've seen some of the stuff that comes out about the math. And, you know, from somebody who, you know, I was in your fair city for four years at Vanderbilt University as an engineering, um, as an engineering student. And to be able to, to confuse and mess up something as straightforward as math really blew me away. Yeah, Where the, basic we're, math. We're not talking right. about, you no, know, not talking, any no. advanced math. We're talking about basic math. Right. Two Addition, plus two subtraction. Four. Yep. Yep. And, and they will tell you that it doesn't matter if you get the right answer as long as your thought process was was right. And again, it just – it really – if they wanted to design a system to screw the thinking of kids up, they really couldn't do much better. Because we we have really moved into an area where there's – you know, we don't talk about absolutes anymore. 
and they are trying to right. erode and undermine the one one of the last areas where absolutes really truly still apply, you know, mathematics. And it's it's you know the whole idea, you know, why do you you know you don't need a constitution, you just go with what's popular, you go with popular sentiment. There is no reason to have a foundation or to anchor us to any kind of principles. You know, principles are an, an outdated idea. You need to be modern and you need to be progressive, and you need to you know. Go with it. Go with the flow. You know, just get about the right answer. You know, as long as you were thinking along the right lines, you know. And yeah, as long as you were thinking properly the way we tell you to think. Right. Then that's all that matters. It does, it, you know, if you come up with 2 plus 2 equals 8, that's fine. Yeah. But no, as that's long as you fine. think the way that we tell you to think, then you're, right, then you're spot on. That's right. And if you, get the, if you get the mathematically right answer, but you didn't think the right way, well, you're wrong. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Well, that that sure leaves us with a with a lot to uh, to think about. Uh, and, and, you know, and and if, if, if people if people are interested, and you get more feedback. I mean, um, you know, this is the one thing I love sharing with people is um is ideas, and you know, I um, hesitant to go into it now because there are so many of them and they take a long time. But you know, if Anybody that hears this, if they are thinking about, if it's burning them to, like it was burning us, that they just can't see their kids dragging themselves through the doors of those schools anymore, um, there has never been a better time to educate your own kids. I mean, the, the internet, you know, not to mention you can get any piece of information you've ever wanted at your fingertips, but it also allows you to connect with like-minded people. And maybe yeah. maybe you're doing this because... You know, because you have um, deep religious convictions and you want to have your kids around, you know, other families, you know, that feel the same way and you just can't stand, you know, the horror of the secular school. Or maybe, again, it's like us where it was just a matter of critical thinking and watching them try to jam these square pegs into round holes. But, you know, if, you know, you've got to let that eat at you and you've got to do what's right, you know, for, you got to do what you know is right for your kids. Are you and you're willing to to connect with people and to help them through this process? Absolutely. I'll, How would they get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch with me um, is uh, by email. It's I live in the state of New Hampshire, so it's N H Silver Farm. So silver like the metal, farm like what we do. N H Silver Farm at gmail dot com. Um, I will. Answer as many questions as I can. I'll point people towards the resources that we found. Um, and I'm also, it's a, everything's a two way street. If people have other ideas or other things that they think that they're burning to tell somebody, I'm happy to hear and, um, and consider, you know, consider it all. So that's, that sounds great. Well, Mike, I'm not going to take up any more of your time because I know you're, you've got a lot on your plate. And <laughs> Indeed. We, we've been speaking with Mike. And you can find all of his work over at silverfarm.podbean.com. And he hosts all of the videos through MP3 that I produce here at the Daily Coin. And he, and he also hosts a whole world of information all on MP3. You can either listen to them or download them. And you can find all of it, like I said, at Silverfarm. Dot podbean dot com and Mike or, or a, a slightly easier uh, URL is simply silverfarmaudio.com silverfarmaudio even better perfect so well Mike I certainly appreciate all your time today and well, we'll you, have Roy. to we'll have to catch up uh, on this in, in in the not too distant future yeah that sounds great it's been a, it's been a real pleasure well thank you so much take care